Stephen, welcome to Movies That Made Me. Nice to be here. So, we had this with Tom Cruise before as well, but you've done too many massive films. Just far too many. So we're going to focus on sci-fi, if that's all right with you. All right. Let's jump to E.T., which mm -hmm. has given me my favourite, my ultimate movie insult. Penis breath. Maybe uh, an elf or a leprechaun. It was nothing like that, penis breath! Elliot! <laughs> Sit down. I learned that far too young and maybe said it much too much in my household. <laughs> so I think my mum would like you maybe to apologize. Yes, yes, mom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I did anything to traumatize your son into the job he now has, which is to traumatize me. <laughs> Good deal. I love the behind the scenes documentary and seeing you dressed up as a old lady mm -hmm. on Halloween with yeah, the kids. Yeah, bag lady. Bag lady. You gotta take me, you gotta take me serious, it's Halloween, folks. I'm, I don't dress this way all the time. And the general feeling to me, watching the film as many times as I do, is that the kids were having a great time on set. They were. <laughs> Yeah, we were, we were all kids. We were all basically the same age on E.T. I was, I was Drew Barrymore and Henry Thomas's age, and sometimes they were my age, and in a sense it was an ageless playground. I wanted to ask you about the Foley work, which is obviously superb in that movie. What are your fondest memories of making E.T. sound like E.T.? Well, I, I think one of the fondest memories I have is um, doing all of the E.T. chewing, the chewing sounds when E.T. Is, is just, you know, he's got a little plate of fruit mm -hmm. in front of him in uh, Elliot's room and he's, he's chewing the food. And I spent a day eating all kinds of interesting sounding, both soft, squishy and hard, crunchy <laughs> vegetables. I hated that day, but I'll never forget that day. I had a spit cup, a spit bucket as well. You, know? you have said before that your favorite ET is the one that was more animatronic towards the end. Mm -hmm. What is it about the ending that is so special, do you think? I guess the special thing about the ending for me has nothing to do uh, with the film mm -hmm. and the structure of the film, because goodbyes are always, always tough. But the goodbye that the kids were experiencing in the real world was tougher than the goodbye they were experiencing through their characters. Because I shot the film in complete continuity, because I didn't think that kids could understand shooting out, out, of, out of continuity, you know, shooting a third act scene first where the emotions and the development of their affinity and their love for E.T. is different than it is in the first act. So I shot the film literally every day we came in and we were on page three, then we were on page five, then we were, we were on page seven. So by the end of the movie, when they're all actually saying goodbye to E.T., they're really saying goodbye to each other. I just want to say goodbye. And the tears are not, uh, you know, the tears that, that adult actors have when mm -hmm. they're completely bonded and, and channeling through their characters. The tears were the tears kids have on the last day of summer camp when they have to go home. Oh. If they're not the homesick type. You know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Jurassic Park. And let's fast forward to Jurassic Park. Where did the come from? I don't remember. I don't know whether the, it was my idea or, or I'm, I, I, I'm going to hazard a guess because Sam Neill was such a sort of inspired, you know, actor with so many good mm -hmm. ideas uh, just about his character. I, I, I can't believe that idea of the way he took off the glasses, <laughs> you know, didn't come from Sam himself. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would say, yes, yes, it was mine, absolutely. And with the Dilophosaurus, yes. oh, nice boy. my favorite kind, oh, nice boy. as a kid, I remember finding out that the venom mm -hmm. and the fan mm -hmm. isn't actually what they did. No, yeah, they didn't do that at all. I, that, I, I invented that dinosaur. That was my own <laughs> original invention. I wanted a dinosaur that spit venom, but when he spit venom, he hooded like a cobra. Mm -hmm. And the hood, I, I wasn't satisfied to let him hood. I needed the hood to shake, <laughs> you know, kind of like, uh, just flap like a flag. It, was, it wasn't enough. I, dinosaurs, you're great, but I'm just gonna give you a director's note. Yes. 
That was the one dinosaur I, 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 I you know, don't even apologize for because I love the Dilophosaurus so much. But that dinosaur was more fiction than science. Now, let's jump to Ready Player One. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay because of all the things they can be. And you have said that the two most difficult films you've ever done are Jaws mm -hmm. and Saving Private Ryan. Yes. And now there's Ready Player One. Yes. Is that your top three? Yes, it is. What is it about this movie that was so tricky? The technical difficulty level, if you had to give something a number through one through 10, this was an 18. Wow. Because I didn't think the movie was gonna work at all as a film unless the audience could bond with the avatars. Hey, are you seeing this? Emotionally. Yeah. In the same way they bonded with the, with the characters in the real world before we saw who their avatars were, or even while we were intercutting so quickly back and forth between real person and the person's avatar. So right, don't, don't do this, I'm not even there. Not for long. And trying to get that level of facial capture and em em empathy and wet eyes and actual performance on a digital humanoid. Are you willing to zero out for the Oasis? Are you willing to fight? That was the, one of the hardest things we've had to accomplish with this story. You shot this in the UK. Yes. What inventive ways did you come up with to make the UK seem like a dystopian America? Yeah, well, we went to Birmingham. We just had to go to Birmingham. <laughs> and that's, that's saying nothing bad about Birmingham. It's just saying that we could not find a city in anywhere in the UK that looked anything like a city anywhere in the USA. And, and Birmingham actually has some architecture which is similar to Columbus, Ohio, even today. But we were shooting the whole film in the UK. We weren't planning to have a splinter unit shoot anything in the States. So Birmingham filled the bill simply because it looked like an American city. Parts of it did. Job done. Yeah. Let's wrap things up with a couple of quick five questions. What would you say is the best memento you've kept over your career? The, the sled from Rosebud. Wow, so not even a memento from your own films. No, the greatest memento I possess is the actual sled from Rosebud. The balsa wood sled, there were three made to burn at the end. Uh -huh. Throw that junk. Wells directed all the insert photography. Wells was happy with the second sled they burned, mm -hmm. and so the th third sled was not needed, and that was put in storage at RKO. And I purchased the sled at a Sotheby's auction in the mid-'80s. Where do you keep it? It's going to be at the Academy Museum eventually. It was at home for a while, then it was my office, but I think it really belongs in a museum so everybody can see it. It belongs in a museum! So there's nothing from your own films that has, say, made it to your office? Yeah, the whip and, and, and fedora hat from the first Raiders movie. And that's just still there every day? Well, it's not on display, but it's, it's, if, I, if I need it, I can... I, I can <laughs> I can whip it out. You're on a phone call. <laughs> I mean it. I really mean it. Exactly. I give me my hat, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, finally. Your total worldwide box office is 9.444 billion. After Ready Player One and possibly Indiana Jones 5, you'll be way over 10 billion. What will you do to celebrate? Well, I don't ever th I don't look at numbers and I don't think about numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm not a numbers crunch. I'm not a numbers person. Mm -hmm. You know, I make movies and I love making movies and telling stories and the numbers, we're all the beneficiary of success if films are successful, mm -hmm. but the numbers don't matter to me. I mean, as much as the audience approving, liking, remembering, mm -hmm. and even years later through satire, recalling. Get me Steven Spielberg. Follow the board. Jurassic Park. Clever boys. Red Ball. Homicide. Woo! <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Great, thank you so much. Right. And, oh, it's lovely. Cut. Beautiful.
Thanks for watching. For more, check out my BBC iPlayer show, Movies with Ali Plum. And don't forget to listen to me on Greg James's show on BBC Radio 1 every Thursday at about quarter past six, where you can hear the very latest movie reviews from yours truly. One.